two, and we are live. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> I'm so sorry about that. I hit the button way too early. <laughs> All right. All right. Hello, everyone. We are super, super excited because we have Dr. Connor Brady on here with us today from Ireland. Hello. Hi, How are you? Nice to be here. Thanks for having me over the author of this amazing book that came out last year that was published last year and i think it took you 10 years to write this book yes. correct? and all my hair yeah absolutely it was just a very long long process uh nearly finished my marriage at one stage but uh, oh. yeah it's hard work it's hard work to do that sort of stuff and uh you know but it's anyway it's fine now it's going down well so thank god for that you know honestly it's amazing and we're going to be yeah. speaking about this a little more but uh, i'm sure most of our viewers probably know of you and know you already but for those of you who see you for the first time can you maybe just quickly introduce yourself and let us know a little more yeah so uh, my name is connor i'm from ireland I'm from wicklow in ireland and uh I started in college, I did the science degree and I have a doctorate in studying the effects of nutrition on behavior. But it was when I was in guide dogs, particularly guide dogs in Australia, that I met the, the, the raw world like in, in a huge way. They were quite advanced in Australia at the time. They were the world leaders of raw because the raw fathers, you know, the, 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 dog, the, the dog fathers of, of raw are Billy and Hurst and Lonsdale and they're Australian vets. So they're, they were, you know, Australia were all over it. But really, it was when I bumped into Brisbane Guide Dogs and I saw the difference when they changed 200 dogs from, from dry to, to, to fresh feeding. I thought, wow, this is just incredibly important, you know, and that started the whole thing. And suddenly I went back into research mode. And uh, yeah, so that was the start of, the, of my kind of um, of my mission. And then I came back to Ireland and I set up a raw dog food company. So I've experienced on the other side, seeing how that works. And for the last eight years, I've been a spokesperson for want of a better word i really don't know what to call myself anytime i see the occupation line on a form i panic i just i don't know what i'm a i write i research and i speak uh, about all things canine nutrition and health so uh yeah i love it and it's 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 ended up in that book there uh, in, that i released in december so uh yeah so it's been a it's been really enjoyable because it's just such a new subject people know so little about it we've been feeding this and now it's like a whole new field of science to explore and like lots of rabbit holes so uh suits me suits me as a researcher you know and also uh i've been reading your blog for many years it's called dogs first and right. i love it like there's so much good information not just about raw feeding but also about like many like diseases that a lot of dogs struggle with yeah. allergies, kidney uh, failure, and like just so much information about how to address them through diet, but also naturally. So, and I always love reading it because it's like... <laughs> That's good. I love hearing book, that. Honestly, I haven't read the whole book yet, but the parts that I have written, it, uh, sorry, <laughs> read, um, yeah. it's like, it's sciencey, but it's still super fun to read. So... That's cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm really yeah. excited to speak about this today. And for everyone uh, listening in Dubai or the UAE right now, we have actually good news because this is now also available at Podega. So <laughs> we're super excited about this because it's actually the first pet health related book that we have in our store. So oh, awesome. yeah. Yeah, I can't believe I'm that guy now. I can't believe that because I had like, you know, I grew up reading Lonsdale and Billy and Hurst and these books that are so influential, yeah. you know, they're still great books. Uh, so I'm just so, I'm, I'm, I'm trying, you know, it's, I'm proud that like my peers, you guys are as into this as I am. And then you like the work as well. It's just so great to be this side of the, mm -hmm. of the project. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy that you're enjoying it. That's awesome. That's, that's really awesome. So Let's start, I would say, um, if you're ready. Uh, we, for everyone watching right now, please just leave your comments or questions in the comment section. We will get to them and we'll do a Q&A later. So um, yeah, the book basically uh, talks about the science or, or um, the debate of the science yeah. between raw and dry food. 
So that's yeah. what we're talking about today as well. So we're going to be talking about, you know, what dogs would eat uh, if there was no human interference. We're going to talk about uh, why vets continue to push certain foods, uh, why, you know, basically the pet industry is the way it is or, or what are the, yeah, the, the things that maybe us as pet parents, we wouldn't really know too much about. So let's start with, what would dogs eat if they were left to their own devices? Yeah, I love, I love this question. You know, if, as a, can you just imagine if you're in a zoo, okay, and you've just, you're on your first day of the job and someone hands you this blue, hairy animal that you've never seen before and they said, you know, okay, there you go, uh, Larry, you're in charge of this new type of blue mammal that we found and uh, feed it. And you go, okay, so what will I, I feed it? And, you know, the person says, oh, he's an omnivore. And you go, okay, right. So, you know, does he eat ants? Does he eat birds? Does he eat rats? Does he eat big animals? Does he eat them fresh? Does he eat them dead? Does he eat fruit, vegetables? What sort of fruit and veg? What did he grow up around? When? How much of each? And it becomes this impossibly difficult question to answer. So, just being told carnivore or omnivore, and anteater is a, is a carnivore, you know, it's not enough to feed an animal optimally. You need to look at a few things. And as a zoologi zoologist, you'd have three things really in your tool belt to, to, to use. And the first one would be, okay, ancestry. Where did this animal come from? The second thing would be diet studies. So when the animal's left to his own devices in his natural habitat, what does he eat? Because that's quite telling. And then the third thing will be the biology of the animal, getting into nitty gritty, turn him inside out. And what does he look like? And you'll know very quickly what he can digest and what he should be fed. So they're the three things. And to touch upon each one of them very briefly, uh, which is the whole first section of the book, really. But it's, the first bit is like, you know, the ancestry of the dog. Everyone talks about wolves and they call their pet food wolf something. And there's pictures of wolves on the and people can very quickly say, look, the dog is not a wolf. And it's not a wolf, okay? Dogs can barely interbreed with wolves anymore. They're very far removed from them, at least 40,000 years. But uh, he, they did come from wolves, for sure. But a far better animal to compare the dog to would be a dingo, because the dingo was a domestic dog only 4,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at the dingo, we see an animal that is completely carnivorous. I mean, 97% animal matter and 3% vegetation. And that's coming from dingoes in the tropics. They eat little birds and they can't shake free the stomach contents so they just eat the whole lot. And so, yeah, we know that this is a, at least 4,000 years ago, this was very much a, a meat eater of sorts. But actually dingoes look exactly like a dog called a Papua New Guinea singing dog, which I've never heard of in my life. But when you Google them, they look identical to, to dingo. So you can see where the dingo came down from Sri Lanka, China, Sri Lanka, down into... Mm. Anyway, very interesting. So the lineage of, of the dogs came from a long line of wolves. And the, the grey wolf has been a, a grey wolf type ancestor, as everyone says. Mm -hmm. They've been a meat eater for five million years. And people will often hold up an example of a coyote or an African wild dog. That's a real typical one. And they say, this, this is an African wild dog and he eats a bit of vegetation, 20% vegetation. Therefore, we feed it to dogs. But the African wild dog hasn't been a dog in 5 million years. You know, it hasn't been related to a wolf in 5 million years. We were living in the trees back then. Mm -hmm. So like, it's, the, it's these nonsensical comparisons. They hold up these coyotes and African wild dogs and maned wolves, but they're just not dogs at all. So that's the lineage stuff in very, in very brief, but kind of more interesting is the diet studies. When we look at the diet studies, there, there's not a lot of diet studies of, of actual truly wild dogs, okay? We've got a lot of diet studies of village dogs, which are dogs that live with people, and then they forage in the dumps during the day, and then they go back to their generally poorer families at nighttime. And I say poorer families because they live in areas with lax roaming laws, you know, dumps around uh, poor, poor areas of India and poor areas of uh, southern Italy, um, Zimbabwe, Brazil. So we have some studies of those dogs and it looks like those dogs do eat uh, a good bit of vegetation, sometimes 10, 20, 30 percent, up to 50 percent in some studies in India. But when, what we quickly, quickly realize is that these animals aren't truly wild dogs. These are animals that grew up with people and people feed them stuff, you know. And poor, yeah, it doesn't make sense. So like yeah. poorer families feed vegetation. They don't yeah. waste meat on 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 
yeah. half stray dogs at their doorstep. So they mm. give them a lot of plant matter. And we know then if we give animals plant matter when they're young, they'll eat it when they're older. So mm. they've done studies of like chow chow pups. Some guy had this unbelievable job of a hundred chow chow pups and he divided them. I can't even imagine what that looks like. And he divided them into three groups of 33 mm. and he could fed one, you know, um, all vegetation, this one, um, dry food with with meat and the other one just meat and what it, what they quickly showed was that dogs if they're fed it early in life a certain material they'll eat that material later in life and they'll be wary of material they haven't been fed it's called the imprinting period for any of the trainers out there it's the really crucial for first four or five months of a dog's life when they do all their socialization but that's also where they learn what's good to eat. In fact, you can actually spray apple in the air of a pregnant bitch and the pups will come out fighting over the apple tainted nipples. So it actually begins when you're in utero. So actually what mum is eating is already gearing the fetus up to what uh, it wants to eat when it comes out. So it's all really technical stuff. Those diet studies are less useful to us because that's not a truly feral dog. We have fudged it. That's why we have videos of cats eating a little bit of broccoli on YouTube. It's like, that is totally not right. Cats do not eat broccoli, but they do on YouTube because they were fed that material as kittens. And so they go, okay, I'll eat broccoli. They have no ability to digest that in the slightest. Uh, not, not good for them in that manner, you know, a raw piece of broccoli. But it happens on YouTube. It just doesn't happen in the wild. So you wouldn't say that's suitable for the cat long term. It's, it's, it bears no relevance to the health of the animal. It's just a thing that you train them to do. So truly feral dogs are very meat eatery. They have very, an awful lot of animal protein and a very small amount of vegetation of the few studies of truly feral dogs we have. So geneticists studying wolf scats hate when there's domestic dogs around because they fudge the results because they can't tell the difference between both scats. So look, that's it in a nutshell. The diet studies are a little bit convoluted. A lot of them are through a telescope and you just don't know what the animal's actually eating. Are you eating carrots or the slugs off the carrots? You know, mm. you need, unfortunately, dead dogs, samples from their stomach uh, to really see what they're eating. Even poo samples isn't great because vegetation is overrepresented in poo. Mm. So that's the diet studies in a nutshell. And then finally, the biology, which we don't need to spend any time on. The biology of the dog is all carnivore. There is very little to say this is an omnivore. Look at the teeth on a German Shepherd. Does that look like a carrot eating animal to you? Does that look like a, somebody that attacks a wheat field? That is a jaw for eating and shearing meat and bone. The back tooth is carnasal, so it sides mm -hmm. down. The huge back jagged tooth is called the carnasal tooth. It sides past, it doesn't meet like ours teeth, it mm -hmm. comes past, so it chops. And that's why he holds the meat and he rips his head sideways to tear off a lump. Extra wide keratinized gullet for swallowing meat. A jaw that just snaps open and closed. Ours goes from side to side for grinding plant forage, but not, not a carnivore. A carnivore just snaps open and closed. There's no sideways movement. So very meat eaty, very acidic system, short and fast, you know, just solid meat eating system. Add a couple of little quirks that suggest they have taken little steps toward carbohydrate digestion, which is really interesting. We found the first time in 2014, they've developed a couple of extra genes for carbohydrate digestion which is really interesting. You know, Darwin would have loved to have seen that. Yeah. But is that a reason to feed them 50% high, like easy digested carbohydrates in the form of wheat and corn, which we're told not to eat at this stage? <laughs> like, of course it's not. And I think Doug Newvin had the best response to this to uh, Gene Dodds. And he said, look, I can digest ethanol and sucrose. It doesn't mean 50% of my diet should be rum and cookies. It yeah. makes such perfect sense when it's phrased like that. You know, you don't need technical scientific answers. It's like, oh yeah, of course. But that's the position that dry food companies are taking. They'll say, oh, this is why we we're feeding carbohydrates. Like they knew about these genes 50 yeah. years ago after World War II when they invented this stuff. So, you know, um, they have taken tiny steps, but lots of breeds haven't. Huskies haven't, Akitas, because they didn't grow up beside farmers of grow, grow, growing grain. They more um, uh, roaming types that eat much more meat. So mm -hmm. they didn't extrapolate out this gene. So look, it's all very interesting. And uh it's, it's, again, a whole fast growing part of science, but those three things taken together would say this is a meat eater and they'd be, to a very high degree, I still feed some plant material, there's some reasons to do that and we can talk about it later for sure, but not a huge amount of it because there's nothing in the science, nothing to suggest huge amounts of plant material is, is a particularly good idea, certainly not carbohydrates. Thank wow. you. Yeah, well, <laughs> that was a long answer. Yeah. Sorry about yeah, that. No, 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 it's honestly, it's it's <laughs> so 
so awesome really and it like, just is for me it just gets my mind thinking and it's like you know i i think about so much you know when when we talk about carbohydrates and, we, and then we look at you know all of these different types of diets whether it's um whether it's dry food raw food or cooked food or whatever it is if it's if it's like in a in a store you know and when you go as a pet parent to go look for the carbohydrate content it's just not there right yeah. and it's like it's very it's difficult not written on it's not written yeah. Yeah. yeah and it's very difficult as a pet parent to even figure out what are you even talking about right like to yeah. actually try to like all right an actionable step to be like okay if carbohydrates is not good pet parent uh, pet manufacturers are actually able to not even tell you to make it just yeah. another step harder yeah. for you to figure it out yeah it's not strange that that's not a requirement it's so yeah. important in yeah. humans so there's no requirement to write how much sugar you use in dry pet food mm -hmm. so are they putting sugar in us i don't know because it's yeah. not a requirement why wouldn't that why wouldn't salt <laughs> And carbs be a requirement on a pet food label. I mean, if a any, macronutrient. <laughs> yeah, it's just like the biggest thing. It's like, why wouldn't? So, if anything tells you, if anything screams that the vampires are guarding the blood bank, it's that mm -hmm. statement you're just after making. That yeah. I can't work out how much carbohydrates is in this. I don't want my dog to get lots of carbs. I don't mind a little bit. You know, it keeps the kibble together, and some kibbles are okay, and less other ones less so. But you have to do, like you said, you need to be an investigative reporter with a calculator and sitting there in a food oil looking to, I mean, it's ridiculous for people that are confused. You just add up what they do give you. You add up how much protein is in it. You add up how much fat you add on, you know, 5% for water, a couple of percent for ash. You add it up and you can quickly come to a very broad, very kind of crude figure, uh, you know, of 50, 60% carbs. And, mm -hmm. but even the carbs thing becomes like, Oh my God, like sweet potato is, is it better than, than wheat or corn? And, so we start moving into grain-free pet foods, which is taking mm. over. It's 50% of the, of the pet food market in the U.S. So it's really dominant kind of product. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, what we still have is high-carbohydrate pet food. It's yeah. just a slightly different, slightly yeah. different uh, source. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's been cooked up and dextranized in a pellet. So to the body, it's, it's, car it's sugar in a flash. So mm. people look at s s pasta and bread and, and potatoes but they don't understand that that white starch is, a, is a, a heartbeat away from being pure sugar to the blood. It's just one tiny digestive step. So people think, oh, I'm not eating sugar. If you're eating pasta, you might as well be eating sugar. It's nearly the same effect on your, on your insulin level. So, you know, we are learning these things now because we have this obesity crisis in humans and we, we, we are now realizing, well, I was about to curse, when sugar came in in the 1970s we had a big problem and and that has just caused mega problems for us and we're trying to reteach the population now that low fat products high sugar is not good exactly. that's not the fat was never the issue uh, it's hard to re-educate the you know companies mm -hmm. are still producing low fat high sugar products i mean there's just no accountability and yeah. so with 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 what we are just trying to understand about humans we should really be applying it in dogs like you said and saying high carbohydrate diets for an animal that doesn't need carbohydrates at all i mean how is that a good idea and they have an obesity crisis among a range of other diseases that come with eating high carbohydrate diets yeah yeah and and you know just what you said because like in your book you you talk about um diseases and cancers which you you believe is is can be linked to what we would call like nutrition you know, yeah, and nutritionally caused diseases. And by the way, I just want to share this. Like the book, it has after each chapter, um, like the take home points. And then have a look at these, all of these references for everyone. Yeah. Like one, two pages, four pages. Yeah. Uh, six. Yeah. I mean, the book. Eight, and, and that's just that's after one different. chapter. Yeah. So yeah. like, this is really, if you want to know the, the science and the research behind it and everything that you've just mentioned, Dr. Connor, um, it's, it's so awesome to have like one place to, to just read it and then also have a look at the research, um, research the behind, behind, it, the yeah. behind yeah. it. So, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and, and you know, and even for us 
um, we spoke a little bit before we went live, we were saying like within our store, we actually have a lot of pet parents that do feed the dry food and they want to do better. So they, mm -hmm. and they do that in many different ways, whether that's whole food supplements or if that's uh, pre and probiotics, or if they raw want food. to feed a little bit of raw food. So we yeah. have like different um, spectrums of pet parents within our store. So only dry feeders, some some mixing and some only feeding raw. So we actually get a, a really good view on what we see how cats and dogs are doing. And we see from our store that a lot of the unhealthier animals are more um, eating the, the processed food yeah. um, compared to yeah. the dogs that and cats that are eating raw food diets. Yeah, but it also then depends on how long the dogs have been on raw and, yeah, and of course. Uh, dry food. So. Yeah, I would say that that's the exact same statement that most doctors are making in human circles. Like the more <laughs> ultra processed food we eat, I think the best diet advice for anybody, all diets work to some degree, but the best diet advice is eat whole foods. You can, you can nearly eat as much whole food as you want. If it hasn't touched a factory or been processed in any way, you can nearly eat, you can eat a huge amount of whole processed whole grains and stuff without it having the same effect in your body because it, it's just the way the, the food is delivered is, is very important. So, you know, again, the science is moving on, but it's actually quite simplistic. Everything your parents said, is correct everything that they told you to eat is correct you know and it's really only in the last 30 40 years that we are we are uh, picking up the products thinking that they have our best interests at heart when you know it's, it's ridiculous but just like you said like it's okay if you're feeding kibble that's fine it's not like you've got to jump to this whole new way of feeding i try not to use the word raw feeding because it startles people i like yeah. the word fresh feeding because yeah. nobody can argue against fresh food particularly that there you go fresh feeder there you go. i love it Damn, I wanted to be the first. <laughs> I wanted to trademark it. But, um, yeah, yes, it's good that everybody's saying fresh feeder now because that is the right way to go. Because yeah. it's, it's just particularly talking to vets because they, they, you know, they, they're, they're, um, they're, uh, they can be a little bit flighty and they, you don't want to say raw well, because yeah. it freaks them out. Yeah. So fresh food is, is, less, is less scary. So literally, as you said, adding anything into dry food is going to improve it. One of the chapters there on the book shows adding literally anything there's been studies of adding in carrots blueberries um you know leafy greens orange vegetables for cancer omega-3 like study after study where you literally add anything to a uh, kibble and the dogs do better which really brings into question the whole complete terminology it's like if this was complete you shouldn't be able to make it better but literally adding anything a, a drop of vitamin e some vitamin c and studies over a long period show that the dogs are do better so adding anything into the bowl, uh, which is probably going to be the end point of the conversation as well, is a good thing. And you can add in so much, literally anything in your store that's not dry food can be mixed in with dry food. It's absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely. It's about bringing everybody along and not, um, yeah, like there's, there's plenty of scope for making your dry food better for sure. And we can come back to that as well, you know? Yeah. So to continue the conversation um, about what dogs eat when they're left alone, now, what happens if we actually feed the dogs a diet that 90% of dogs worldwide are being fed, which is primarily, or up to 60%, or you know, between 20 and 60% carbohydrates? What happens? Yeah, yeah so like, it's interesting, when we leave dogs to feed ad lib, so it's, we present them with food, the food groups, lots of different foods, and it's like, right lads, eat what you want okay that's feeding ad lib and when we do those studies of dogs we know that they eat initially they'll pig out on fat and then they'll eat a lot of protein with that and hardly any carbohydrates and the longer you leave them there feeding ad lib the less they feed on fat and the more they feed on protein and carbs always stays very little so when they're presented with foods that they want to eat which is classic zoo pharmacosy if anyone has never encountered this word before zoo pharmacosy p-h-a-r-a M-A-C-O-G-N-O-S-Y. It's Latin for animals. They know what they want. Okay, so uh, they don't eat carbohydrates to a high degree. And those studies are done by pet food manufacturers. So they do the study. The dog says, I don't want that. And they put it in the food anyway. So why would you do that when you, the dog is saying, I don't need that. They've got this incredible face. 25% of their brain is olfaction. I mean, thousands of times better. If your nose worked twice as well, you probably wouldn't be able to live together. Could you imagine if it was like, thousands of times better we have no understanding of how they perceive the world 
So they're saying they don't want that food and yet they feed it. So we already have those studies and yet we insist on feeding this product. So what happens when you feed lots of carbohydrates? As I said, carbohydrates like a kibble or, or um, a pasta or potatoes, that is just a type of complex carbohydrate. It doesn't, it doesn't say sugar. It's not granulated sugar. Or so it's not a syrup, but very quickly that digests into sugar. Okay. And that is absorbed through the gut wall and it spikes your insulin. And that is the problem for everybody. Okay. Eating carbohydrates, sugar is a poison in the blood. So mm-hmm. insulin comes in to pack it away into your fat stores. That's what it does. It's not the same role as fat and, and protein to a lesser degree. So we know that eating high carbohydrate diets, particularly high sugar diets, but uh, you know, simple carbohydrates or even starchy kind of carbs increases uh, obesity. And that's, we know the link. There's a lot of kind of science that comes behind that. But that's a very, very much established that these carbohydrate diets are the problem and getting sugar out of the diet is, is really, really important. Now we're learning the effect on the, on the probiotics, the good flora, and all the things that shift in response to this diet, on and on and on. But, but the obesity one is, is, is just too easy to talk about. We know carbohydrates aren't, the bigger, uh, are, aren't going to be a, a serious role in this obesity epidemic in the future. We know we will get on top of this and we will eat more normal foods. The more interesting one at the moment is pancreatitis and cancer. So cancer is exploding in pets. Like one in te- like dogs are 10 times more likely to get cancer than humans. As if mother nature has engineered this dog, this animal to be the most cancer stricken animal on the planet. It, does nobody wonder why? It's like, we've got these amazing treatments when your dog gets cancer. All boxers of rotties are very prone, golden retrievers. Every breed seems to be very prone to cancer. When you get cancer, we've got these amazing treatments for you. That's the advice today. So it's just ridiculous. You've got 90% good health, cancer-free animal, and then you get cancer. Why would you focus on that last little bit when this whole part of his lifespan has been healthy? How do we stop getting cancer? We don't feed cancer, okay? So you need to steer clear of the things that can cause cancer. Fair enough, you know. Don't light cigarettes for your pets. Don't give them all these other things that we know cause cancer but we know that tumors need sugar, okay? So they're actually covered in insulin receptors. They need insulin more than they need sugar, they need insulin. So tumors are covered in these little insulin receptors. They need insulin because it helps them grow. So that's what they want. That's how you see cancer in humans. You radioactive tag a can of, I was gonna name a brand there, a can of cola and, uh, or some drink and you make, a, you make a patient drink it and then they, they have a look with a, a PET scan, they call it, a, about an hour later, and they see that the tumors will light up like a Christmas tree mm. because they're absorbing all the insulin. So mm. we know high sugar diets fuel cancer growth in every animal study, including dogs. And we know when we cook carbohydrates out, cancer plummets in, 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 yeah. in dogs. So we've got those studies. So we know carbohydrates have no role. If your dog gets a cancer diagnosis, you will need, you need to stop feeding carbohydrates immediately. And that that isn't the advice coming out of the veterinary sector today. It is a, you know, is very bad. And it's just goes against every principle we have. If you look at Keto Pet Sanctuary in the US, yeah. incredible yeah. company. They're taking uh, end of life dogs. These dogs are nearly going to be put down. They've got cancer in pounds. They take them out and they rehabilitate them on high fat, moderate protein, zero carbohydrate diets. We know carbohydrates have no role in obesity. We know they've got no role in, in dogs in, in cancer and now pancreatitis. The pancreatitis thing is, is for me, one of the worst ones because I've seen dogs with pancreatitis and two thirds of cats and dogs, healthy cats and dogs presenting by mid age have some form of pancreatitis. So just like the cancer thing, it's just a casually accepted epidemic of chronic disease. In this case, pancreatitis, which is agony lads. I mean, when your pancreas starts to complain properly, you can start digesting yourself. And that is serious, proper gut pain that you, takes a while. So an acute bout of pancreatitis is something you wouldn't wish on your worst enemy. Apparently, like, like, it's like a gut shot. And a lot of dogs, uh, like a gunshot to the guts. So a lot of dogs and cats are experiencing this because most of them are fed these high carbohydrate diets. But yet vets believe that it's caused by fat. So you're, you'll come in with your dog in dire straits and the vet will say, did you feed him a bit of fat? Did you give him the fat off your, off your steak? Did you give him a sausage? And you kind of go, well, of course I did. I mean, it's a bloody dog. Why yeah. wouldn't he be able to eat a bit of fatty meat? I mean, that's normal food as, as the studies show. That's the food they want to eat. Fat is a high prized commodity because there's not a lot of fatty animals in the wild. It's such good energy. They stuff it in when they can get their hands on it. Why couldn't he have a sausage? And they, you're blamed for the issue. When yeah. in actual fact, 
we know now that high carbohydrate diets, it's like the body says, lovely carbohydrates. It's like petrol as opposed to diesel. It's like fast energy. And the body is in this kind of um, system where it says, lovely, I'll burn carbs. And so it starts to burn the carbs all the time and it doesn't burn fat. And yeah. so the fat builds in the blood. So the vets have been looking at the blood going, oh, the blood fat is rising. It, you've got to stop eating fat. No, you should have been stopping eating carbs. We've all the studies to back this up now. This has been known for years. The likes of Mark Roberts over in the US has done the studies to show it's at fine in dogs. We've known for four or five years, you need to cut out carbs in dogs to avoid pancreatitis. Has that filtered into the veterinary sector? No, we've still got pantry, magic prescription dry foods that can be sold by a news agent. So there's no prescription because there's no medical qualities whatsoever in the food. Uh, but they can sell this high carbohydrate food for, for pancreatitis, which is, goes against every bit of science. Same with it. They've got high carbohydrate diets for obesity. They just use more indigestible fiber, which is just ridiculous. It's like, oh, we've got to keep the carbs up, obviously. But now we'll just put in more indigestible fiber, which is like a runway model chewing tissue three days before a show to lose the last gram of body fat. It's just ridiculous concepts. We know carbs are playing a role in obesity, cancer, pancreatitis. And we could talk about bloat, which has spiraled in the pet population since the 1970s. It's exploding. Uh, bloat is a very common thing to strike deep-chested dogs. You should be in fear of it if you have a deep-chested dog. And if you are, you need to cut carbs out of the diet. You need to cut soluble fiber, most importantly, which is corn, which would be one of the worst, but mm. lots of other ingredients. Because bloat is gas that comes up from the intestines. It's not gas that comes in from the mouth. High feeding bowls. Uh, you know, resting your dog before and after meals does not reduce incidence of bloat in dogs. Most bloat cases kick in an hour after feeding. So the idea of resting your dog for an hour to avoid bloat is, is nonsensical. More than 80% of cases kick in after an hour because the food is eaten and then it hits the intestines and this food feeds the wrong bacteria. And gas comes out, it's bacteria farts. They build in the intestines and they go up to the dog's deep chested cavity you get that flip and your dog is in a very, very dangerous position as he swells with gas from the inside. Another mm. shocking, terribly common disease affecting one in 10 deep chested dogs. And it's just accepted that this could be the ending for your deep chested dog. Let's knit his stomach to his and his spleen to the side of his, so to avoid it. Like it's just, it's barbaric. And that these things, these are very solid nutritional principles. There's no arguing over, there's no debating going on. There's no, uh, dry feeding rep trying to say this isn't the case but in, this information is still coming out of the veterinary universities and i struggle with that bit i don't think it's a i don't think that they're like I don't, it's, it's not cynical they're not trying to create patience for themselves but you know they do believe what they're doing is correct i'm not slagging off vets vets at the coal face that are doing all the work they mean so the best for your animal. Of course they do. They work so hard to get into college. They work so hard in college and they work so hard outside of college. They deserve every penny they get. Absolutely. But they are grossly misled on nutrition because they don't learn it correctly in college and they have fast food clowns giving the lectures and it's, it's needs to change quickly because pets are getting harmed daily, you know? Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Um, it's, it's, you know, hard. like again, you yeah. know, like because, because, as a pet health store, as, as mentioned, like we, we see all of the dry fed dogs and, or we see a lot of people come to us as a last resort, you know, as a holistic pet health yeah. store. So we're not yeah. vets or anything, but they do come to us with their problems. And pancreatitis is one of the top yeah. uh, issues that we deal with. Uh, mm -hmm. Obesity in dogs, it's allergies, it's allergies yeah. and allergies. all of these things. And cancer as well. And, and cancer, which we, I do believe a lot of it is, fueled by the Carbohydrate. carbohydrates. Yeah. Yeah, 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 it's just the wrong food choices. We've got the human studies yeah. as much mm -hmm. as we need to know on and, and the top, like uh, go, the top governing health governing bodies are saying, ease off the carbs, guys, get them down. Certainly no sugars, you know, eat whole foods, that kind of thing. But those messages are completely lost in the, in the yeah. pet food realm. Isn't it funny that you guys are the people that, you know, at the and 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 me, you know, that's I'm in the same position. I get the guys that they've been through two or three really good vets, and the dog's in bits by the time it comes to me. Yeah. And it's right. like, we need your help. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, yeah. these, if I can help here, I hope I can. But this is a dog that, you know, we should have seen a year ago. So you get the recurring skin, yeah. the book, and the allergies is a huge thing. 
and we've got great studies now coming out of University of Helsinki. Yeah, mm-hmm. so, yeah. you have seen that dog risks. What a yeah. what a legend. Yeah, I just yeah. linked one of their studies yeah. in our uh, in the comments section. Yeah. And got, um, like this is something that we always talk and like we raise so much awareness on the fact that we want to see your dog before you have the issues. Like, yeah. because it's just, it's so heartbreaking. Even hearing you talk about pancreatitis and knowing that that's such a huge thing that people come to us for. Um, but hearing you talk about how painful it actually is. Yeah. I had no idea. And, and that's actually something that, that we talk about a lot with our dog, Milka. And when we have pain sometimes, I mean, thankfully it doesn't happen so often, but like, you know, sometimes like if you have tooth pain or something, you don't see that from the outside that I am in pain. So a lot of times we talk about that with dogs, like you just won't know sometimes if your dog is in pain or not. So that's why we just emphasize so much on, you know, prevention and, and yeah. just doing the best that we can. And, you know, it's so crazy because like hearing you talk about it and I, I know I'd like, I've, I've researched this so much. I know the, the problems, but hearing you say the way that you say it again, it's just like, I'm just, I just feel so overwhelmed, you know, with knowledge yeah. that I already know. So yeah. I don't even want to imagine how other people who are watching right now feel who, where it's the first time they're hearing about all of this right now. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, for anyone who's feeling overwhelmed right now, please um, take it one step at the time. You know, we all start somewhere, some, sometimes. So yeah, don't, don't, don't be super overwhelmed and think that you're doing everything wrong right now because you're not, um, you know, just what matters is that we learn, we expand our horizon and we learn new things and we do one new thing. Tomorrow will be better than today. So yeah, I, I think that. that's really yeah. important. Yeah, it, it is. I think people kind of, people can kind of react two ways. They can either say, you know, you can either have complete faith in your vet and that's one way to go about it. And the other way is to kind of panic a bit. But like, these are chronic conditions. These aren't overnight issues that, you know, you ate some rat poison and you're in trouble. You know, yeah. this, this, the dogs can live long lives on kibble, which is remarkable, you know. So yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I would say that, you, like you said, just make positive changes. Use the information coming in to make a change. Uh, it's not about leaping to this whole new world that you need to stress about. It's just having to think about it, let the information settle in and go, maybe all is not perfect. And really we've only touched on three or four diseases. It's just so much. You can yeah. talk about dentition and, and gum disease. We're only learning about that and kidney disease and all the stuff that comes with feeding wrong stuff. And now the new thing really is the new frontier for people to stress about. The new frontier is, is gut flora because we're mm-hmm. feeding this, ultra processed food that's been chemically preserved, proudly chemically preserved, because there's no life, there's no bodies on our food, apparently, but when we look at it, there's plenty. Um, so far more likely to recall for salmon oil than raw dog food, 70 mm-hmm. times more. But anyway, um, yeah. look, they come full chemical preservatives on it, as if that's a good thing. So I remember when, when a friend of mine is, does photography and he used to put broken up pieces of bread out the back of my shed in behind, I would fall down behind the couch and he'd come back and he would always remark that the cheap bread rolls never had any mold or fungus on them. So yeah. he'd, he'd use it for, for luring in birds and stuff. And so Larry cheap, just said this the other day. I did. <laughs> I totally said it. It's like, this bread has been here for so long. Like, yeah. See, yeah. Observe, I like that observance. You know, not in our house, not, by not, the way. Not, not in our house. It was, it was your house. It's okay. Yeah, we, no, no. <laughs> we visited her, her family, yeah. and, and her brother was there like a, a, a week before, and, and he left some bread there, and then we were there maybe two weeks after, and we were like, this bread is still here, and it's like, <laughs> it still yeah. looks fresh. Yeah. yeah, it's mad. I mean, like, it's like, it's like when you buy, if I try, you try to buy things more organic, but when you buy grapes in the supermarket and they're in that tub and, you know, they look like grapes for weeks in your fridge, you mm. buy organic grapes and after two days, they just go, <laughs> it's yeah. like, what happened to my grapes? Well, that's the effect of not having ethylene gas pumped on the, onto the yeah. food. Mm-hmm. But yeah. like with dry food, like kibble was the same thing. So I burst a bag of kibble years ago and like you find it two years later and the kibble is still perfect. So yeah. not even mold and fungus wants to live on this food. 
So your dog eats this food and it washes over his gut flora. And we now know that our gut flora, the, their DNA outnumbers 10 to 1. There's, mm. more, there's more other animals than there is us in our body, which is amazing. We're essentially a machine to keep this little garden going. That's all we're doing. We do everything they tell us chemically. So it's really interesting. So a healthy gut flora is so important for your health. So you're eating this chemical sludge and good gut flora say, I don't want that, you know, or it'll kill them off. Where and pathogenic bacteria that go, I actually don't mind eating this stuff. I'll eat it. So you get a growth of pathogenic. You get a dysbiosis in your gut flora. So as opposed to the good guys who digest a lot of your food and give you a lot of the fats and vitamins and minerals that you need to live, you don't get those guys. You get this dysbiotic gut and this pathogenic bacteria produce toxins and stuff that makes you inflamed and gives you recurring gut issues, which is the number one reason for going to the vet. And yeah. we give them chemically preserved meat treats. And then we, what do we do when they've got good issues? We give them antibiotics, which napalms the gut flora. But you don't replenish the gut flora with anything good. You just put in more chemical dry food. So there's nothing has been done to nurture your, your gut garden with, you know, care, fresh food free of this stuff and dechlorinated water and probiotics and prebiotics, as, as Larry said earlier. So like this sort of stuff is so important to keep your good, good flora happy because all your happy chemicals are coming from your gut. You have a whole other brain. You have more neurons firing around your gut than you do in your head. So it's so important to keep those guys happy for every aspect of your dog. And we could talk about behavior to which cows come home because my doctorate was in that and I love nutrition and behavior. But it's so important to keep that good flora happy and producing happy chemicals. And when they're not, you get the crappy bacteria that don't give you the good stuff. Your dog is the exact same thing. And they share their good flora not only with each other, but with us. So Helsinki started looking into that and they started looking at the fact that raw fed dogs have a much more robust good flora. Like, of course they do. It's, it's obvious, you know, but yeah. now we're showing that it helps with atopy in dogs. It changes the, the, the genetic expression in their skin. Mm -hmm. uh, inflammation in dogs is reduced on raw fed. So one of the studies was so impressive because you know what's interesting? When you get to the position where you start talking about, you know, science, they're evidence-based scientists and, Generally, people that leap to strange products shout very loudly about science. Okay, science has saved us. They did it with uh, baby formula. You know, now yeah. we've done one better than Mother Nature and it took us years to reverse that damage. And then now it's the same with most, a lot of drugs that people take. And now it's like the same with, with kibble pet food. They get there and they say, prove using science we're wrong. Mm -hmm. So they take that leap thinking science is behind them. And then you must use huge amounts of scientific proof and even when you present it to them in the book they don't bloody read it but mm. to, to to sway them from their from the stance but i always say what science did you read that that p makes you pick up that kibble and they'll change the subject and i'll say no no hang on we'll, we'll do study by study i'll show you a study where raw fed dogs compared to dry fed dogs and uh, where raw fed dogs come out well you know we have a few studies but you've got no studies showing dogs fed 50 percent carbohydrate cereal based kibble is actually a good thing for dogs. No long studies at all. Nothing to show that that's a better way of feeding than a complete raw dog food, for example. Why yeah. don't those studies abound in the literature? Why isn't there so many that they would just be chucking them at you until yeah. you went away? Those yeah. studies don't exist. So when they want to talk about science, I always bring up that study by Helsinki where they compared raw fed dogs to dry fed dogs. Exactly. And they found that raw fed dogs were five times less inflamed, I think was the figure, yeah. less yeah. of this... Uh, and when they changed, yeah, the homocysteine, I think, was the marker they looked like. Yeah. And when they changed the dogs from dry to raw, the levels of inflammation dropped by five times. Mm -hmm. So it was such an obvious, you know, and then they looked into it more and then it helps with atopy and in, in, um, in staphies and all sorts of things. All the things we're seeing in practice that you guys are doing, your dog's got allergies. OK, we're going to simplify it greatly. We're going to move away from a product with hundreds of ingredients in it and chemical preservatives. And we're going to move to a very simple diet. How are you on turkey? How are you on chicken? How are you on beef? OK, and then tell me your allergies are still there in a month or two or what ailments are left after we've moved to simple diets. And you'll find that a lot of the external my dog has an allergy to a flea bite or to a dust mite everyday stuff that the dog should be well able for mm. when you get that immune system back to strong eating simple diets you'll find that a lot of this secondaries we call them evaporate the recurring yeah. ear condition the recurring yeah. skin condition yeah. i would fix the gut first 
and then come back to me in two months and tell me yeah. you were occurring, you know? Yeah. So the temptation is to look at the issues as you spoke about earlier, Charlie, and they, they see the issues and they, they treat the issues. When the symptoms pop up, we'll, we'll, we'll stamp mm-hmm. them out. So they give anti-inflammatories, but why was your dog inflamed? They'll give like antibiotics, but yeah. why did my dog have a gut flora issue? So they, they keep suppressing symptoms with drugs that have no role in getting the dog better. And then you're back the next month for more drugs. Yeah. And incredibly, people believe the drugs are a success. And it's like going back with a bad car every month to the same mechanic. At what point do you go, this mechanic is, is poor? <laughs> and honestly, it's, it's, yeah, that's a great way of saying it. But it's something that we deal with so much here. I cannot tell you, like, exactly that circle that you just described like the dog goes in with the symptom the symptom is treated with something that doesn't fix the root cause and the dog no. just goes back in back and back and back in loop, loop, have, loop. it's it's incredible countless and stories countless stories yeah. and, you know everyone who's who knows us and who's listening right now you this is basically exactly why we we always talk about gut health because it's the number one thing we talk about because when we focus on gut health a lot of the times yeah we, we address the root problem because gut yeah. health is so important well it's like playing guess who if you're playing yeah. guess who and you've got all these faces you don't guess you know the weird little thing that one of them has you guess you know the thing that knocks off the most of them first because exactly. that's how you play what's new so it's like if gut is at the bottom of of most of the issues that you're seeing okay and it is it really does explain so much and it's so simple to address mm-hmm. it's like okay let's start with that one and then come back to me in two or three weeks you have nothing to lose by trying mm-hmm. it if you are the owner of a dog that's chronically ill with recurring skin or gut conditions particularly or allergies Get the dog onto a simple, fresh diet, very simple, fresh diet. Go down to the guys in Podega. Let them walk you through some very simple, pre-made raw dog foods. Two weeks on that one, two weeks on that one, two weeks on that one with some fresh water, you know, and, and then come back to me and tell me it didn't work. But if it improves it a lot, then you probably know it was food related. If it's not food related, then food won't cure it, you know. So uh, those simple experiments can be done with products that you guys have in store. So mm-hmm. people shouldn't be uh, afraid that they have to do these things themselves or they need their vet's permission. No, they don't. These products are tried and tested. They're made by co- companies that know what they're talking about. Mm-hmm. It's just a different type of food. So give it a try because I, I, I tell you, it's, it's, the gut is a huge impact. We see a skin inflammation. That's smoke coming out the window. Yeah. And people's, there's no point spraying holes on smoke coming out the window. The fire is inside the house, you know? Exactly. So it's, uh, that's where you put the holes in. That's yeah. very well said. Um, let's address some questions. We have some questions. Um, Larry, you. So we have one from Shana. She's, uh, she says this one is for Connor. Um, what, what was one part when putting the book together that you were most amazed to learn? Oh, um, I would say that the, my biggest revelation was the bloat piece because nobody had come up with that bit yeah so it's nice to be the first with something helpful and useful you stand on the shoulders of giants and i'm just regurgitating facts and figures and studies that other people have done but the whole bloat piece is brand new uh, so that was very rewarding for me not enough people are talking about pancreatitis and because mm. of the sheer amount of dogs suffering it i'm proud to be one of the first people to be talking about it but totally using the likes of mark roberts and stuff so you know, I think the carbohydrate chapter was was by far the most effective, uh, mm. and also the the pre- the prelim to that, which is the diet studies that nobody had ever considered because I'm the I'm the first person I've been trained in that sort of thing, and I never really realized if there was of any use what I've been trained in. And suddenly, I look at the diet studies in dogs, and nobody had ever considered a lot of this stuff that I'm talking about. So they were the the building up to the carbohydrates. The dog needs meat, so how's he doing on carbs? terribly is the answer mm-hmm. that was my biggest kind of revelation and it, and it's the biggest ingredient in pet food it's the easiest one to whip them with and uh i really hope that puts to bed the carbohydrate nonsense coming out of them may be a source of energy you know you know donuts and fizzy drinks are a source of energy what's the point you know mm-hmm. they don't use carbohydrates for sled dogs and when you use carbohydrates in sled dogs they get more injuries so to get talking about maybe a source of energy the whole carbohydrate delusion is just an example that you are trying to make money out of people. And that's what I focus on now. So I focus on the carbs bit all the time, because if you can show that one bit is nonsense, well, the rest of it hopefully will fall a bit. So 
that was the most important bit for me for sure. Um, the chapter, the whole section on the veterinary, the links of the the, the financial chains to um, to the veterinary sector was was very enjoyable, except for the fear that I had. I had to run it through a lot of barristers because I was afraid of the repercussions from companies that are notorious for pulling your pants down in public and uh, and and they don't like that sort of stuff. So the freedom of information requests and that kind of stuff, a lot of them done by other people. That was quite revelatory as well. And that annoyed me and that kept me up a lot. I had to do a chapter before that to, to set people's minds. I had to show them how rotten the science has gone in in the human sector, one in two of our published studies are utter nonsense. So that, the big claims backed up by, by heavy amounts of science, that really changed my worldview a lot. And I kind of well, went into quite a dark place because you can't come out of that after writing till four in the morning and, and sit down over breakfast with your wife and say, you won't believe that one in 10 Americans are on antidepressants. I mean, with no mon- monopoly on the blues, one in 10 adults. I mean, it's like, that is not okay that this stuff is going on. And, you know, one or two of those conversations is okay, but when you wake up every morning with those thoughts, very few people in your circle of friends want to discuss that. So that was a big revelation for me. And it took me a few years to get me back onto a kind of a positive access and say, there is things we can do about this. Uh, so that was the most effective on me, but the most revelatory, the most the biggest point was the carbohydrates one. Mm-hmm. Another long answer to a question. Sorry, guys. Oh, okay. I mean, yeah. That's incredible. I mean, like, wow, that's yeah. Anyway, I mean, that's a work. Ten, ten years, right? You, it, it took ten yeah. years to, and and you can when you read it, like it's, it you can tell that it's a lot of work that was put yeah. into this book. So yeah. it's really amazing to hear the behind yeah, the scenes a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Like I think a lot of people go like I'm, I talked to Rodney and Viv and Becker and. They, they go through the same thing right in the book. It's just, it's hard work and you're terrified. It's like you're about to walk down the main street of your town naked. It's yeah. like, I'm about to put out my work there and you're going to criticize this. The, yeah. the hell. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's scary. You're waiting for some mega errors and stuff, you know. But mm-hmm. Yeah. Rodney well, actually has a question for you. Rodney. Habib. Habib. <laughs> yes, Rodney. Habib. Rodney yeah. positive. Uh, he says, um, question for Dr. Brady, please. I really love his accent. He reminds me of, of James Bond. However, it's been now brought, I can see it too. <laughs> it's been brought to my attention that he may not uh, want me comparing him to English 007. So my question <laughs> is: Is he okay with me calling him James Bond and not offending him? Ah, oh, Habib, he's just a he's a schmoozy fella. God, I love Rodney. <laughs> Rodney, I love you. Um, I don't think anybody has a problem being compared to James Bond. There was an Irish James Bond, Pierce Brosnan, uh, who was in my father's hardware shop one time, which is our claim to fame in Greystones. But um, yeah, no, uh, go ahead. Call me James Bond all you want, Rodney. You can call me anything, Rodney. Go ahead. Rodney is the rock star, so uh, I will do whatever he tells me. Mm-hmm. Good to know. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, so then we have a question from Judy. Um, she's a raw theater and she's wondering what are your opinions on nutrient testing of the dog yeah um, yeah interesting when you do it of the foods they're they're mm. terrible oh, actually, people think that these I, foods are controlled but of the dog that's an interesting one because that's people are, are divided over that i mm. would say that all animals can achieve balance over time and um, so you know you don't in the vitamins that you don't store you need to eat a regular amount of them the vitamins you store you can be pretty laxadaisy with them over time we've got studies of people not eating any vitamin c for months so uh like i would say that yeah you could have a look under the hood now and again and see where you are after a period of illness your gut sick dogs you know have been suffering malnutrition uh for 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 months because of their illness I would generally not tend to do that, though. I, with some diseases, you know there's going to be vitamin deficiencies. With pancreatitis, you've got a fat issue. If you've a fat issue, you've a vitamin E issue. And if you're a dry-fed pancreatitis sufferer, there's hardly any vitamin E in dry food. So you now are in dire straits for vitamin E. So a lot of the illness that comes from pancreatitis comes from a complete lack of vitamin E in the food. Fresh vitamin E, which differs massively from the vitamin E added to pet food, which only has 10 or 12 different uh, types of vitamin E. There's actually about a hundred different isomers of it. So, 
in answer to your question, I would say that I don't tend to do it. I tend to think that a well-fed dog will be in pretty good nick. But if you wanted to do an, a, a vitamin and mineral check of the dog now and again, great. If you find something askew, I would use food to top that up. Uh, that's where the likes of uh, the Forever Dog, Bobby's book, and Karen Becker's would be very strong on. So they would be much much more attuned to that than I would be. I would be a bit more lackadaisy with kind of a, a nutrient testing. I wonder about it. Uh, yeah, it's a very it's a it's a glimpse in time as well. They can differ very wildly. I would mix up my foods a lot to make sure I'm hitting what I need. I would use nutritional supplements. Uh, as opposed to vitamin or mineral supplements. So anything that you guys are recommending is going to be fine. Any of your dark green additions your, from your spirulina, I'm a seaweed guy, that stuff is great to, to knock off a few edges. Good quality salt for some of the rarer minerals that we never talk about, like how much strontium does your dog need? No idea, but the only place you're going to get it is salt. So good quality salt in a raw fed dog because they're on a no salt diet. So um, there is some cool little additions in your uh, again, the Viv and Becker will be saying adding in the bits to the bowl. That's how you're going to be topping up failing uh, nutrient reserves, and uh, and varying those up. Blueberries one day, you know, fermented carrot the next, whatever. Uh, a few crushed seeds, a drop of plant oil, and mixing it up all the time. Good quality eggs, good quality meat, good quality sardines. I mean, a sardine is such a brilliant food. I mean, it's like oh, yeah. one of the only complete foods, surely to God. I mean. Uh, Mm -hmm. A sardine has got the head and the eyes, which your dog gets very little of. Okay. It's one of the only sources of that. It's the best omega-3 as, again, Habib, because I know he's listening, so I'm going to keep on promoting him. <laughs> uh, as he just, you know, bet the hell out of the fact that you can't really preserve omega-3s as well as we thought. Uh, so the whole fish oil capsule thing, which you would have started about five or six years yeah. ago, was kind mm -hmm. of an eye-opener for us. And then you start looking into the industry and it turns out, yeah, even if it's in a dark glass in your fridge, as soon as you open that top, it gets to oxidizing. Fats yeah. do not like being out of the food. So uh, a whole sardine, the omega-3 in that, and it's a source of all sorts of minerals that, that the dog doesn't yeah. get a lot of. So those are the additions that top up the vitamin and mineral thing. I'm not sure about in a healthy dog, would I go looking too much? I would just vary it up and assume he's hitting it. Um, but if you think he's ill, certainly after an illness, you will be deficient in a lot of things. Dogs will be gut sick. Uh, they'll be deficient, deficient in B12 and all sorts mm -hmm. of things. So yeah, you might then but I don't know. I don't know if I do too much of it. No, that's amazing. Uh, also good that you mentioned the fish oil uh, problem. Um, that's also, we, we get a lot of questions of why don't you have fish oil? Why, like my vet recommended salmon oil. And we always yeah. explain exactly that. It's just so hard. Probably yeah. not even possible to find a fish oil that didn't ax oxidize yet when you yeah. when you feed it to your it's dog. So. Yeah, so selling whole sardines, little sprats, dried okay. sprats, mm -hmm. uh, dehydrated carefully. Uh, that's that's all one way to do it. Although a lot of tiny sprats are dried in the sun, so what good is the fat? I'm not sure. Uh, so you know, sprats frozen from the freezer is probably the best thing. Exactly. Now the mussel industry is great in Scotland, so we. We get bags of frozen mussels for half nothing. Just a little tiny. I mean, I don't eat them. I think they're gross. Yeah. But uh, yeah, but somebody has to. And my dog <laughs> seems to love them. So I get a I get a handful of frozen mussels and I just throw them out into the grass. You know, you've yeah. people over and the dog's spinning around the kitchen. It's like Dudley, bloody hell, relax. I get a, <laughs> that sounds bad. I get a handful of mussels whoop out into the garden. Go enjoy yourself and relax. Yeah. And he's out nuzzling around in the dirt and eating food off the ground, which is a yeah. brilliant idea for soil probiotics and all the other stuff. Yeah. That so less of eating off these clean sterile bowls and more throwing the bits and pieces. You've got a handful of blueberries. You want to give them to the dog, throw them out into the grass and the muck and the sand and yeah. let them find them and dig up all that dirt. That is good stuff for him. So uh, yeah, absolutely. I love all that sort of stuff. I'm getting really coming back to it. When you look at how they feed the animals in the zoo, we should be feeding our dogs more like that. Behavioral yeah. enrichment. This is why yeah. they love meaty bones and tearing the meat from the bone. And it's such a cool item for a dog to chew on. And instead, he gets this plastic bone-like item. You know, it's ridiculous. Exactly. So, uh, yeah. I love I love Kongs. I love all those different ways of feeding that people are coming up with. It's cool. It's something to do. You know. Absolutely. Yeah. Um. Let your dog get dirty, as uh, mm -hmm. a lot of <laughs> yeah holistic like health professionals say. Maybe one last question. Um. What do you think about brown rice and oatmeal and dog food? Um. So. 
in uh, as a as a staple i don't want to see any kind of carbs so like brown rice is is a tiny tiny difference to white rice okay it's got a little bit of fiber in it but believe me the the glycemic load of that item is very similar to white rice it's just that got it's got that little tiny bit of fiber which slows down the the thump to the to the to the blood glucose okay so it's a tiny bit better but that doesn't mean i'd buy dry food based on 50% brown rice you've got the exact same problems there mm. I like oatmeal a lot of people aren't mad on us uh, it's one of the better ones it's definitely up there as a carb source we get cold winters here in Ireland it's rotten weather half of the year so if I'm sitting there eating hot porridge and I'm taking Dudley's food out of the fridge I feel sorry for him even though these are scavenging carnivores that eat carcass that are always cold I would uh, still mix in some hot porridge with the, with the cold tucker. And so he's eating sometimes like this meaty gloop in the morning time. He likes it. He likes everything. But so I don't mind a bit of carbs. I would say to people that like, if, if you were making your own food, adding in some carbs and stuff is fine. You know, a little bit of porridge or you think that you want to, maybe you're really tight on cash and you can't, you suddenly realize I've got two, you know, two, what can be a big dog, St. Bernard's, at home two giant dogs i can't feed these dogs meat all day well instead of jumping to a poor quality kibble as a way to save money which you don't in the long term believe me uh you end their life a lot quicker in my opinion uh i would say why don't you feed a good quality raw but thin it out with some what you would call filler ingredients add in 10 percent porridge add in 10 percent plant matter that costs you half nothing and yeah. suddenly you've got 20 percent filler now your food bill has dropped by 20 percent because porridge costs nothing you buy a kilo of porridge for buttons and it makes three kilos of food. So like you can add in those filler ingredients yourself, but you're adding in whole organic oats, which is completely different to the disgusting quality wheat and corn that they use in highly dextrinized form in kibble. So you adding in 10, 20% of whole grains is fine. I think a step above oats again is quinoa because quinoa is, a, is more of a little plant than it is a grain. It's higher in protein. It's got the fiber. So it's even less of a kick to the, to the blood. So quinoa is pretty cool. I like that as well. The good thing about oats is for a sick, a gut sick dog, if we're really struggling initially to find something to work, I would say, guys, because people can source it, tin of salmon and porridge, 50-50. Let's just get a very simple diet going in this dog so you can read this material on gut sickness and, and hopefully make the move towards real food. So I use oats because oats can actually soak up a lot of the water in the poo and it can produce a give them a bit of relief and people can get it in every single shop. So I usually have two or three recipes in my head, you know, scrambled egg and quinoa, uh, tin salmon, good quality salmon, Pacific salmon uh, and, and porridge. And cause people go, Oh, I've got that. And you go, yeah, even tuna, tin of tuna. Oh, what about the mercury? Your dog has got way bigger problems. Than <laughs> Don't be worrying about that. Focus on the, on the issue at hand. And people go, I oh, know I can get tuna. Great. So tuna and porridge. You can make that. They mix it up. They give this gloop to the dog. And he puts out a good poo and they go, oh my God, my dog's having a good poo and they're crying with, with happiness. And you see, that's the power of food. And then we'll move the dog onto a, a cooked a food of some fashion because that's an easier thing for them to understand. And then we slowly move them towards raw. And before they, need, they know it, they're feeding eyeballs to their little pooch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a slow, slow move over. Yeah. That's a great way of saying it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, just one, just one question because somebody asked this question. We we skipped past it. Um, but now now it's moving. Uh, would you recommend adding ghee to a dog's fresh food diet? Yeah, like uh, I know a buddy of mine, Nick Thompson, that I do a bit of work with. He's just mad on any real forms of animal oils, uh, butter, ghee. Loves that stuff. So. Mm -hmm uh yeah i'm less familiar with ghee okay so but the likes of any real animal fats like butter and the likes if you wanted to put that in the dog's food absolutely we've got great quality butter in ireland we've got grass fed uh, cattle and we've got this butter that people seem to like so yeah if you wanted to put it in i would probably be going more towards animal fats than i would anything else so you know while butter is made on essentially an animal fat it's uh you know i tend to go towards the fresh fats and just fatty meats and that if i thought the dog needed it i'm a believer that dogs need lean diets more so than fattier diets uh but it doesn't really matter to the dog you know he's he gets what he needs so the, the oils i add in are animal fats generally so i like my marine oils if i had to but that comes from a sardine now as i said before um but if you want to add in ghee, I'm, I would say that there was probably other nutritionists that have looked into that way more than I have. As long as that's raw, unprocessed, 
you know, as virgin as possible, as little process as possible. I bet you that's quality fat. So yeah, absolutely. I know Thompson rates it, so I'd have to back him. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we add it to milk as food sometimes, but of, of course it's, it's grass fed, which is, yeah. I think is the most important thing when, well, when it comes to sourcing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like, and, and we're already learned, we're talking about it tonight on, on the thing we do, this live that we do, that the sourcing of meat is just so important. Like even sourcing of the vegetables we're buying, we just assume that the vegetables we're buying are nutritious when they're grown on the same soil, poor nutrient, to bereft soil every single year they add in nitrogen on top as if that's the only nutrient the plant needed yeah. it needs everything you get all your we think cbd just comes from hemp it comes from lots of different plants but we are so bereft of these nutrients now iodine and cbd and some of the rare to find minerals because they're just not on the soil anymore so we're eating this colorful veg thinking that we're getting the same whack that we did 30 years ago but we're not yeah. so that is a mega problem that we're going to start facing and whatever about vegetables look at the meat that some people are eating mm. a lot of the meat people are eating are coming from in in the, in the u.s over 90 percent of the beef comes from concentrated animal feed operations CAFOs. that meat is just fed wheat and corn fat it up as quick as possible and kill it and that's where we have mega problems of antimicrobial resistance and all the other stuff that's crept into the food yeah. chain. Britain has brought in some mega farms to copy it. We took what, what Asia was doing essentially, uh, particularly China, and they, they perfected it in the States and now it's coming into uh, the UK because we all want burgers for 20p. We don't want to pay for meat, but the meat that we're getting now is not good quality. The last tip that I'd give to people is that buy good quality food. It's an investment. It's not... You're not, you know, oh, raw dog food seems more expensive or this raw seems more expensive than that. If you can find a raw dog food made on good quality meat from good sources, outdoor reared or pasture fed or the stuff that you know is going to be better for it. Any natural fed animal is going to be so superior nutritionally. Uh, it's, it's worth that extra spend of cash. We are spoiled with cheap food. It's decimating our health. We're full of chronic diseases. And all we're doing is focusing on disease cures now as opposed to can we just stop getting chronic diseases for a while? Another mm. graph from Habib's book, which I'm not ruining for him because he's already shared it on his page, is that would you rather a life that decreases like that all the way so you're kind of sick in your 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and then you bottom out? Or would you like a graph that runs along with the same thing and then 80 dead? And mm. you go, of course I'd rather that one. Yeah, so why are we accepting these chronic diseases? It's not normal in societies that eat real food. The longest living societies are generally poor. Out in the, the, it seems the further you're away from a pharmacy, the better off you are. Rural <laughs> Afghanistan, rural uh, Japan, they're the longest living uh, societies, not these ones that are living beside these amazing hospitals that we have. That's not, it doesn't seem to be helping us at all, you know? So yeah. the same for the dogs, guys, you know? So it's, it's a fact. Yeah. Or the more far away from the fast food chains. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, it's hard to know which one, isn't it? Like, and the yeah. fast food chain is the number one thing. We all love a bit of dirt. Who doesn't love a bit of dirt? You have a couple of beers on a Friday. You wake up on Saturday. You need a bit of dirt. Okay, that's grand. Mm -hmm. But we do it as a small portion of the diet. Yeah. I don't yeah. like the phrase everything in moderation because that allows an awful lot of bad products in moderation. Mm -hmm. I would say processed food in moderation a tiny amount of processed food and as much whole food that looks real that you made yourself in the kitchen and yeah. talking to people over a meal and going back to that way of life is definitely the way to go it's uh, like everyone is sure about that and it's like we just took our eye off the ball with the, with the pets and the, yeah. but it's coming back around it's the first time that we're learning stuff from pets really normally we apply our lessons to pets and now we're looking at the pets yeah. and the pet shops and going what's going on in the pet shops jeez i need to start eating better look up yeah. look what yeah. i'm giving the dog it's beautiful you know i mean that's how it happened for us yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. that's no that's i mean and and there was a comment earlier as well saying that she's fascinated about what we've been talking about and that she know she has always known that she feeds her dog better than herself, but now she yeah. wants to look into feeding herself a little yeah. bit as well as of yeah. tomorrow. That's great to hear. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I'd like to think I'd do it for myself as well, but I I as my wife would say, if they could just see you eating that, you know, I'm sitting there eating. <laughs> yeah. that. And you know, but it, it is in it is in strict moderation. I use small amounts of it, mm. and I don't give it to the kids. I don't have it around the kids. I I just don't bring it into. The, if it's brought into the house, I will eat it, and so will the kids. So we just don't have it in the house. I'm no like 
I don't control this. You're at a party. Eat what you want. I don't care. It's just not at home. You're just not going to find biscuits in the cupboard because they just don't work out for me. I'm going to eat them all yeah. at one o'clock in the morning, ball and crying. So it just, it just can't be in the house. So that's a good way to be. And then you eat a bit of dirt when you're out. Fine. Who cares? Yeah. You know, life's too short, particularly theirs. Their life is too short for me not to let them lick the ice cream spoon now and again. You know, I don't care. You know, but anyway, yeah. strict moderation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being on here and sharing all of your wisdom and knowledge with us today and opening our eyes once again uh, to everything that is going on in the pet world. And for everyone still watching, this is the book, Feeding Dogs uh, by Dr. Connor Brady. And we're super happy to have had you on. We're happy to be offering this book now at the Podega. Um, and we hope that, uh, yeah, we see more of you, uh, in the future. Yeah, and you know to find me. I love this. I love doing yeah. this. You know? Yeah, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> Very yeah, it is. And it's just, it, it, it gets too serious. You know, there's, there's, there's too much seriousness. And the one thing that a lot of the top people are doing is that they make it a lot more digestible. It's easier. It's yeah. fun. You can take the mickey out of each other a little bit. And it's just not so serious because they want the, the other side wanted to be serious. They want to bed you down in this antagonistic, yeah. nasty. Yeah. And it's like, you know, I just park all that and just kind of have a bit of fun with it. It's just so much. So yeah. talking to the likes of you is just so much more productive than talking to a lot of the stuff that you try to do behind the scenes and you're just beating yeah. your head yeah. off this wall and it's, it's just not effective. It doesn't change anybody. So this whole raw movement is coming from changing the people. You know, um, yeah. Jim Morrison said, they've got the guns, but we've got the numbers. It's yeah. all about shifting the people. And then the industry will be forced to change because they'll go, oh, we've still got this dry food over here. And it's like, <laughs> okay, suddenly they're going to have to start buying out the raw dog food companies. And slowly the veterinary industry will change. But uh, yeah. it should be a lesson to people to show how, how, much our health sector could be yanked out of position by corporate influences. Uh, oh. People should forget that because it's happening in all industries all the time, human, pharma yeah. and pets. So it's a, it's a lesson that we shouldn't forget too easily because uh, yeah. you'd never hand over your health to anybody. Nobody cares more about your kids than you do. You know? Yeah. So true. And you know, we always say it to on, on our channels as well. Like nobody else is going to pay the vet bills for you. You are the yeah. one who goes yeah. home with yeah. a sick dog you're the one who has to keep going to the vet so at the end of the day nobody can force you to yeah. feed a certain food nobody can force you to take a certain medication nobody can tell you you are not allowed to get a second opinion you're yeah. absolutely allowed to get a second yeah. third or yeah, fourth yeah, opinion. yeah. because yeah. at the end of the day and it, it really yeah our dogs depend on it so, yeah, yeah yeah people don't uh people don't get a second opinion that's such a good one it's like why yeah. would you keep going to the same vet just pay the same amount of money to a different vet who might have a different area of expertise everyone's yeah. obsessed i'm obsessed about food i blame everything on food but i'm not right all the time because sometimes it's not food but i'm like oh it's definitely food and the next vet will be like oh it's definitely floor chemicals and the next one's like oh it's definitely a parasite I mean, that's why we have different doctors. If this one kid, this one vet can't be the master of all animals. It's just impossible. So mm. jumping around is such a good idea. Regarding yeah. the health issues, yeah, you're, you're, you're responsible for your vet bills. People shouldn't forget that Mars has more than 50,000 vets on the company payroll. 50,000 yeah, vets. Sense. Mars is the biggest producer of ultra-processed pet food, and they have more than 50,000. They're the world's biggest employer of vets. Biggest producer of ultra-processed pet food, the biggest employer of vets. Yeah. Like, that's a wake-up, you know? Bloody hell. So, yeah. anyway, I don't want to end on a negative one. Yeah. Crazy, honestly, yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Anyway. Yeah. I guess you think it. I, I bet it is, you know, I've, I've got to go pick my child up from the crash. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. thank you so much. We really appreciate it. We'd love to chat yeah. with you again soon. You and guys, find me. Yeah. Thank you yeah, so man, much. Thank you to Absolutely. everyone who is watching and we'll see you all soon again. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Bye. Thanks very much, Larry. Ciao.